Okay, so I think we can start. Thank you very much for choosing this session. I'm a little bit surprised that so many, so many of you uh, choose this microservice talk uh, because microservice PHP application are just PHP application but smaller. <laughs> so my name is Marius Gil, and today I would like to share some concepts, some topics related to the microservices ecosystem, uh, topics we have to care about, but um, usually we didn't uh, know nothing about them. So don't expect uh, implementation details, it's not just PHP application, it's just microservice PHP application, it's a just standard PHP application, just a little bit smaller, faster, but expect some more concept around the microservices. Topics you need to really, really care about them. So on the daily basis, I'm working in my company, which is a source ministry. It's a PHP consultancy shop. Uh, so I'm working with different teams on legacy software, on architecture, trying to, to, to make our project a little bit better. So I'm also the part, one of the founder of PHPRs. PHPRs is a Polish network of PHP uh, developers. So all PHP user groups in Poland are working together under this brand, so this is really, really, uh, really, really funny, uh, funny stuff for me to be a part of PHP RS community. So, the story, the standout story of, about the microservices, I've got a lot of my stories, how we can move or, or what kind of operations we should apply to make our application better. A couple of years ago, I was working as a CTO in Warsaw on uh, on a really, really interesting software. It was PHP application dedicated to generating recommendations over the internet. Um, we had a lot of widgets across most popular websites in Poland, and all the traffic from these popular websites hit it with our application, and we would try to analyze this traffic, try to generate very, very personalized recommendations, what kind of other what kind of other web pages or what kind of other advertisements you should uh, visit, you should click just to earn money. So we started from Symfony application. It was 1.4, very, very old stuff. And uh, in just one week, after the seven days for the first deployment, we hit at 1 million page views. So it was from this traffic was uh, generated by one client. So in every single week, after every single few days, we collected more and more traffic. So after one year, we had a lot of traffic. We had a lot of servers on AWS cloud because this was our, one of our requirement. We had to be very, very scalable. So we introduced a puppet to our infrastructure. We used the, the AWS API to, to create um, images of our servers. We had some scalers. Of course, some manual works as well. So we had to scale up with our application. But the problem with this software was it was just a monolith. Very, very monolithic application. But this application was composed with different um, elements. We had some trackers. Uh, we, had so, we had some uh, widgets uh, displayed over the internet. We had some processing layer on our application, data storages, panels for users, for admins, a lot of back background processes, and so on, and so on, and so on. So we had, of course, some uh, developers. We had some administrators working on this monolithic application. And uh, one day we realized, okay, it, it, it's, not, it's not the best situation for us because every single time when we would like to scale up our software, there's only one single way to do this. We had to take our software, all the packages, and just create another set of instances running exactly the same software. For all the components I mentioned, there were only one or maybe two which should be scalable. 
is it really to be very, very important to have a scalable admin panel? <laughs> Come on, not really. Is it uh, mandatory to have a scalable user panel? Uh, our user, our business user, clients, it was 2,000 people, maybe. Our customers, our, our users for our software, uh, I mean the users which are uh, Process were processed by our widgets and our software. Yeah, it was like millions of them. So from all the stack, from our applications, only two elements, I mean the, 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 the layer responsible for delivering the recommendations and generating recommendations, yeah, this element should be very, very scalable. But unfortunately, there were part of this monolithic application, so Every single time, even we would like to, to, to increase our capacity, so we had to scale up all the processes, all the, all the background applications, and so on, so on, so on. So the problem was, hmm, what was the reason for this problem? I think uh, very, very bad design at the beginning. Because sometimes before we apply a real TDD, we should think, design, and then develop. If we we're able to identify, okay, this is a part application which should be very, very scalable, so we should extract the software, this part of the software for the main base, maybe to another uh, repository, another deployment processes, another service, to make it really, really scalable. And this is a standard story behind the microservices. When you need to scale up, or if you need to move really, really fast and don't break the things, so the standard approach with monolithic systems not play so well. So this is a place where we can introduce a microservices. A microservices is not so old stuff. 2014, maybe 2000, beginning of 2014, the microservices term explodes, right? And right now we had a lot of microservices frameworks, a lot of microservices talk at the microservices, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the very, very first stage of the microservices explosion was about only and only about the good stuff about the microservices. The microservices will help you. Yes, of course, sometimes. And, um, but sometimes there are also a hidden part of the microservices ecosystem. So let's start from the beginning. What is the microservices? What are the microservices? Uh, from the Adrian Crockford, Crockford, one of the, the mentors from this area, is a perfect definition. Uh, it's a closely coupled service oriented architecture with bounded context. And every single bounded context should be completely independent from the other software. So if you've got this kind of design in your software, you can probably scale up only a few bounded contexts you really need to scale up. So instead of scaling all the system, you can just pick one of them, one of the elements, and scale up. And of course, you can model your uh, silos, you can model your workflows, uh, you can mix people working on the microservices and create a very, very wide competence team responsible for running, designing, operating, and maintaining microservices, let's say like, like Amazon. Yeah, and then you've got the situation when you uh, have a possibility to, to, to almost unlimited scale up. But the idea of microservices is very, very simple and problematic at the same time. So we've got the, the, the separated part of the software completely, maybe completely independent in the context of the technology from the other elements of the software. At the same time, each microservice may use a dedicated, should use, may uh, sh should use, sorry, should use a dedicated data store with data needed to run this service. So if you've got 10 microservices, it probably means that you've got a 10 data stores do you see any problem here? Okay, so if this is, let's say, um, a microservice dedicated to serving a user data. Okay, so this is probably SQL database. 
maybe just one table, just users serving your data. Um, if this is a microservice dedicated to generating recommendations, if you've got the user, you've got the information who is following who, let's say we are talking about the social network application, a SQL database in this place, maybe not the best solution. Maybe a, a graph database or other NoSQL database will be a, a little bit better. So, but this is a completely different data store. And this is probably another completely different data store. Maybe SQL, maybe not. So, the, the benefit from the microservices is you can scale up on the, this element. It's fine. But what about the data? What about the data? If a new user or new data arrive to this microservice, all other elements, all other microservices should be informed, okay, we've got the new data. So it means that at least we should have a layer for data synchronization. Bunch of microservices upon a single shared database, it's a receipt for the failure always. Integration through the database is, is receipt for the failures, no question about it. So what kind of solutions and what kind of patterns we can apply to synchronize at different data stores. Okay, so today we've got the solutions like RabbitMQ, events, um, and this is a probably one of the best idea to, 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 to execute and introduce to our system. If something was happened in one microservice, okay, so event was fired to, to, to the bus, let's say the RabbitMQ or, uh, or other solutions, <laughs> there are plenty of them on the market, and then, all the other microservices may react, may introduce this value to uh, the same, uh, to, the, to the private storage. It's fine. Try to use, uh, try to use or try to execute a transaction. It's very, very problematic. And uh, another thing really, really hard is about the integration. If we've got 100 microservices. And 100 microservices is a very, very small number. And uh, there are huge projects where the overall number of microservices is counted with thousands. So how we can integrate, how we can provide the, the feedback or the output from the application to our users. So small demo. Uh, this is a small PHP application, uh, part of the, the, the production uh, base, but a uh, few microservices uh, were collected and composed into small application. This is just a demo. Uh, how many microservices do you see or you can recognize on this, on this uh, uh, web page? Uh, this is a small home page where there is some randomly taken texts here and here. Um, this is a hard-coded header, and this is a current, action, maybe not current, uh, this is an exchange rate from the March from the National Bank of the Poland, current rates for some, uh, for some currencies. How many microservices do you see? Three? Why three? Which, which is third? This, because this is probably the one, this is the second, and the... The first one was? Translations. Yeah. <laughs> of course, you don't, you don't see the, uh, the the code, so this is uh, some uh, cheating. But the, there are four microservices here: one for the text, one for the action trains. There, there is no translation, but there are two more uh, microservices. And the one is responsible for sending information: how this page looks like, what kind of other microservices are embedded on this web page. And there's the last one, which is the first behind the web server, responsible for merging all the data, all the HTMLs, and sending um, this information uh, to the client. So all, all of them were implemented in uh, PHP with Silex, so Silex small web server, uh, web framework, but one of them is really, really slow, as you see. I reloaded the page. 
So it took less than two seconds to, to render the page. So <clears throat> another possible problem, how to identify the issues in the microservices world. If your application is composed from 200 microservices and one is very, very problematic, which one? And uh, speaking about the integration, uh, this is a part of uh, Amazon website. And you see few microservices, just few. They have thousands. Each one of them must be very, very fast. Maybe some, some other, um, uh, maybe some of them are composed from the other microservices. And if you would like to, to introduce a result to the, to, to, to the user, you've got a lot of options. This one is called UI composition. Each microservice may render some UI with HTML, with CSS, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, one layer in your application using ESI, SSI, Ajax, iframe, whatever, should compose these UIs into the single web page and then react to the, to send this output to the, um, to the customer. So there are a bunch of solutions you can apply. If you are using SEI, you can use a varnish which is very, very fancy solutions. You can use Compocture. Compocture is a middleware, comp microservice composition middleware for Express, so not JS, but we can compose uh, microservices generated by the uh, PHP stack. So using this kind of composition for microservices, for example, using Compocture, you can introduce some modules in your HTML. There are Let's say this is a part of, this is the first widget. It's in separated files, of course. Uh, this is a second widget, but this widget should embed another microservice. And this is a path where this microservice is available. So then we've got the whole web page where the other microservices are connected. So every single time where the uh, request hits uh, a web server, web server asks the, the middleware, uh, for composition, hey, compose this URL for me, and this application will resolve all the microservices, all the applications behind will be executed, and the output will be uh, collected. And of course, this is very, very, uh, very, very uh, tiny implementation because a composure is very, very complex software, and this is only one of possible solution we can apply. So we can cache output because this is HTTP uh, uh, layer, so we can use headers for caching, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So UI composition is just one possible solution. And there is a huge, huge software in Poland uh, which is built around this, this pattern. If you've got a lot of microservices in your ecosystem and you would like to, to expose maybe a, a more advanced interface for user, okay, so you can apply another pattern called API uh, Gateway. You can have a lot of microservices, all the fleet of microservices running different databases, et cetera, et cetera, and different technologies. And above them, you can expose another service. Every single request to your API will be transformed into series of requests to your uh, microservices and the API uh, gateway will wait for the responses, compose them into the single response and send uh, to the client. So <clears throat> if you are using Amazon, there is a software for that on AWS Cloud. If you are using your software, of course, in your infrastructure, you can write the API gateway on your own. You can use, for example, Engine Plus. So another set of solutions, another set of uh, possible um, tools to use. Or you can use just backend for the front. Since if you've got, uh, let's say, a, a rich 
a single page application running on React or Angular, so you can power your application with just uh, JSON or REST, RESTful uh, microservices. So, about the structuring, do you think, is it easy to, to, to split an application between the microservices? What do you think? Is it easy or not? It's really, really hard. Why? Why not? <laughs> not easy. Not easy. You've got the right, because if you've got your application separated into the, the, the dedicated and small applications, the microservice, one of the microservices requirement that there is no dependency between the microservices. If there is no dependency between microservices, it means that you should be able to deploy them in the random order. If there is a specific order in your application and there is a specific order in your deployment processes, why this software was divided in this way, probably it will be much, much easier to combine everything in the monolithic application. And believe me, sometimes it's much better to have a monolithic application because there is no such thing like bad, uh, bad, bad monolith. Why? Because uh, why the monolith are not so bad? Because you've got everything in single single application, you can use memory to share your data. Uh, the problem with the monolith is that monoliths are usually very very bad design. Even if your application is very very complex, even if your application has a lot of different bounded contexts, you can use a little a lot of different techniques like domain driven design or bounded context to split to split your uh, software into the modules, organize your code base into the modules where every single module is communicating with other modules via the memory, via the, the RabbitMQ or whatever. But you've got the single code base easy to deploy, easy to manage. But if you decide to split your application into the, into the microservices, you need to care at least for the tooling, configuration, service discovery, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you know at least one tool you can use for every single topic, yeah, I think you can then, you can, then you are ready to, to, to start um, a microservice development. If not, you will probably stuck with some problems. Not now, but later. And uh, let me show you an example. If you've got, let's say, <laughs> a bunch of microservices uh, responsible for, let's say, for media transcoding, where they are located. If you are using the cloud, uh, where are your microservices? Where they are located? How your application may touch your microservices? If you, run, if you start up, let's say, 20 more instances for this service, how the application uh, should get them? So service discovery or maybe some, some configuration management. So unfortunately, for every single box, <laughs> there are a bunch of solutions, a bunch of techniques, usually tools, uh, which will be very, very helpful to run your microservice cluster. And, uh, and every single box is needed to run a, a professional-grade application. And in my city, in Wroclaw, there is a company um, which is very, very happy to, to, to work with a huge platform responsible for connecting the, 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 the other companies. It's a huge business, by the way, but the, the problem is that they stuck with monolithic application and then decided to, to, to move uh, to the microservices world. But instead of 
hooray method and implementation, they spent six months to just prepare a development process and all the processes around the microservices to, to, to prepare a just skeleton. They spent so much time on the deployment processes, monitoring processing, de designing a, a best possible way how the microservices should be implemented in this company. And after six months, they had one microservice in production, one microservice in production, and this microservice was about generating the current time, nothing more. But at the same time, they established extremely good a process around the microservice. Why they spend so much time? Because they know that they will have uh, hundreds of the microservices. And this is a much, much better situation to spend sometimes at the beginning to have a proven and well working uh, a process and just a single process, a single method and single skeleton for the, all the microservices instead of having a 25 different deployment methods and 25 different monitoring methods. So, because, <laughs> like Milton Friedman said, in the microservices in the world, there is no such uh, thing I free lunch. So, maybe from the one side, there is a really, really for the developers, it's really, really good situations to have a small applications. Small applications, uh, it's easy to read, easy to modify, easy to rewrite, but at the same time, there's a hidden distributed complexity. If I've got my application and my application should talk to other, so there is some, some complexity around them. What about the communication? Maybe the communication will fail. How my application should survive this information? So in PHP world, we are maybe not stuck, but our uh, a standard way for the communication is usually HTTP. And HTTP for microservices sometimes doesn't work well, especially in the PHP world. PHP is not the fastest language. I'm sorry to say that, but I love the PHP, but this is not the fastest uh, language, even in PHP 7. So you op the application you saw, it was pure HTTP microservices communication. The Compose uh, microservice called another service just to fetch the JSON data, how this page looks like or should look like. And then the, the Compose uh, microservice talk to other microservices with UI composition method, hey, fetch me the data, fetch me the UI. And, um, but sometimes if your application is huge, or if you would like to implement a microservices around a full stack Symfony free, your application will be very, very slow. So, but fortunately, we can use another communication protocols uh, because the, the, there is no, there's no need to use HTTP for all the microservices. You can run your microservices, let's say over AMQP, and your services will be up and running all the time and when new request from the AMQP server will arrive, your data will be processed and pushed. Where? To the AMQP. So it will be much, much, much faster. And, uh, and right now, I'm working on two applications. That both of them are based on Symfony 3, where all the backend is implemented as a microservices. And uh, Symfony 3 application, just the front end, know nothing about the microservice architecture. When the request from the user arrives, the Symfony 3 application only submit a request to the AMQP server. It's no matter it's a GET request for the data or the submit change request for data modification. It's just a message to AMQP server. And then this message is routed so the microservice cluster, and this microservice cluster is up and running, so the response is very, very quick, and the response is transmitted to the Symfony 3 application. 
So, of course, we can compose these methods uh, depending on our on our needs. There is no such there is no bad to mix them together. Why? So, the same time, if you've got the microservice up and running and processing your your data. This is very, very important, important thing to, to monitor every single action. In this demo, in this application, do you think which of the microservices is slow? If you've got, okay, exchange rates, because <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and it's not cached. It's not cached. <laughs> Uh, it was it was easy example. If you've got 200 microservices, it's not so easy to identify the, 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 the issue. But if you've got a good monitoring, I mean good monitoring, it means that you are monitoring every single microservice in the context, how much time you need to, to process the data. What is, if you are using uh, HTTP um, uh, microservices, what are the number of HTTP responses? And at uh, the same time, during the talk, this application is a little bit heated in the background. And this data are generated on the fly on, on my laptop. Every single microservice, a compost, text content, a page layout, and uh, the action traits is monitored under the time execution and the response uh, code for the HTTP. All this data are collected and inserted into InfluxDB and presented in Grafana. So try to imagine that you've got 250 microservices and your application is slow. So if your, if your production is slow, there is no time for looking uh, for, the, for the issue. Uh, you should be automatically alerted which the microservice is very, very slow to react. So let's change small. I just activated the cache. Application should respond a little bit faster. And it is automatically visible on the on the charts. So of course there is a whole stack of monitoring behind. There is an influx uh, InfluxDB, dedicated time series databases um, set to, to collect the data from the microservices. Each microservice in the Silex is wrapped with very, very small middleware running the timer and stopping the timer and registering the timer. Each middleware is exactly the same. The small difference between the microservices, middlewares are just the name. What is the name uh, of the metrics to submit? Yeah, if you've got a bunch of the microservices, it's really, really important to get to know what's happened. And of course, monitoring is only one of the issues. We should care. A logging, distributed logging, each service generates a lot of data. I mean, a lot of logs. So you should have some small layer for log aggregation to collect all the information in single place. and. Uh, it's not so easy as you think. It's not about collecting all the tail logs into the single place. If you've got the request to your application and then this request explodes to other microservices and maybe this microservice um, will hit another microservice, if this microservice explodes, is it easy to find all the path and connect all the all the microservices call 
to join and find the, 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 the original HTTP request from the user. If you have no connection between them, you can do this. So if you've got this kind of problem, you should, for example, use a correlation ID. Each service, if there is a call to another service, should embed somehow in the headers or, or somewhere the information about the ID of original request. And then, if you log something, try to log everything with this correlation ID. Then, if something happens um, during the, the, the further phase of your request execution, you can ask your data logs and give me all the, all the requests, all the logs connected with this correlation ID. If you are using the Docker, <laughs> there, is, uh, there are some, some solutions which allows you to, to, to add a correlation ID on the network level. So <laughs> from the developer perspective, it's almost sometimes not so important. The service discovery. Uh, if you are familiar with Apache Zookeeper or Console.io, the software you can use to orchestrate your microservices into the some, some, some catalogs, when your application, when your microservice uh, is up and running, this application may register itself to the, to the catalog and then your whole other elements in your application may ask the catalog, hey, give me the service code, let's say, a Redis or MySQL. And then you can uh, split this information around the, um, about the, around the, 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 the whole database. So the most problematic part, the most problematic part uh, from, the, from the Microsoft world are the data stores. You remember this, this initial uh, chart when all the microservices have separated databases? If we are working on the monolithic application, it usually means that we've got a single data store, usually. A huge, huge MySQL database where we can create a transaction, we can create uh, a, a lot of joins to fetch a data. This model is called a strong consistency. If you've got a dedicated different data stores and you've got some layers to communicate them, for example, with events, there is no strong consistent model. Your model is called eventually consistent. Your data will be in consistent in future, maybe in the next 10 milliseconds, but right now your data stores are in consistent state. Because Let's say this way, uh, a SQL database was changed, your microservice published the events. The events is somewhere in the messaging layer, but this event wasn't prepared, wasn't processed by another microservice, so your data are inconsistent. Um, it also means that sometimes you should care how you design your services there is no such thing like transaction on the microservices because there, there are different data stores. So sometimes you should um, model your services in different ways. So the general way how to model microservices is each microservice should be built upon the business, not technical uh, capabilities. So you need to know how your business works really, really good to identify a transaction boundaries, and you can use these transaction boundaries to, to avoid some eventual consistency issues. And the last problematic part in this world is that one problematic service, one very, very slow uh, microservice may ruin everything in your app. If your application is, uh, is using asynchronous calls, like this demo, one slow microservice ruin performance of your applications. So sometimes you should care about the circuit breakers. If your part of your application, one or maybe more microservices are not working well, your application should be ready to cut them automatically for some time. 
and then after time, some time, your application may check if this problematic microservice or fleet of microservices is uh, operating well. So <coughs> you can use, let's say, um, circuit breaker pattern. Circuit breaker pattern is very, very uh, small thing. After every single success call, you can notify uh, a circuit breaker that this service is up and running. After the failed call, you can inform there was an error. And depending, what, depending on the threshold on the service, your, your circuit breaker may allow or block call to the microservice. Of course, your application should be ready for this kind of operations. And your application should react uh, properly when the service is not so um, uh, performant. So if you are thinking, should I use the microservice or not, because this talk is a little bit about uh, disadvantages of the microservice, start to think if you really know the elements from the nine boxes. If yes, and your application, your system, and your organization is uh, a matter, and you've got a lot of automatization, automatic deployment, automatic monitoring, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, this, in this scenario, you can use the microservice. If not, if you've got a lot of manual work for deployments, if you've got a lot of manual work for the monitoring, try to fix your organization first, and then try to implement a microservice um, architecture. Because in the microservice architecture, if you've got, let's say, 100, 100 uh, microservices and three deployments per day for them, it's not so easy to, 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 to perform in the manually. So that's everything for me. If you've got some questions, I would be happy to, 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 to answer. Hmm? If not, so thank you very much. I'll be somewhere here to the end of the day. So thank you.